Farmers Against Zombies, Book 7, written by Alethea Morgan. Jessica, zombies. How in the world did my life change so much that zombies were the first, last, and every thought in between while I was awake? It had only been two months, but I felt it like years had passed since the world had been normal. I honestly wasn't even sure there was something that could be considered normal anymore. My life and farm had gone from being just a small place for me and my two kids to the head farm operation for the entire area. Most of that was due in part to my recently discovered older sister Trish and her family. They'd shown up at the start of the zombie scare and brought ex-military guys with her for guards. Trish hadn't even known that her husband was working for the military, which is why we'd fared better than some of the other farms when the apocalypse hit. The zombies had been few and far between, but as the cities were taken over by the dead, more were headed out to the countryside. That's where I was headed this morning. There had been an alert that a large group from one of the major highways had veered off and could possibly come our direction. I still wasn't sure how I'd ended up as one of the leaders in this brave new world, but here I was, driving a truck out to see how our wall to keep the dead out was coming. If this horde was as large as the scouts were saying, then I wasn't sure that our partially built wall was going to do anything special. My truck bounced along the empty road until I hit the area where it came closer to the edge of the highway. We'd just decided that we needed something to keep out the dead, but other people as well that might try to steal our livestock or vegetables. Unheard of only weeks before, the end of the world was making those left behind bolder in taking whatever they wanted. No one was even trying to be moral or have ethics anymore. We weren't going to survive the end of the world if there wasn't some sense of order for those left behind. A set of woods, or forest as some would call them, thinned out as the highway drew closer. How's it looking? I questioned Dutch, who'd been sent to meet me at the clearing. Well, he pointed toward the wall that was barely visible from our side, and walked toward the outpost up in the tree. You can see from up there about how far away the horde is from catching up to us. Hmm. I gazed up at the tall ladder that I needed to climb. Guess it was now or never, I thought with a sigh. Slinging the gun I always carried with me over my back, I used the sturdy rungs to make my way up to the top, ten feet off the ground. They had constructed the outpost between two trees, and seemed almost like a treehouse rather than something that was keeping everyone safe. Hey, Kevin, I greeted the guard on duty. Looks like you've got yourself a pretty nice place here. They had put a mattress on top, along with chairs and a small table. They rotated with at least two people up there at all times so one could sleep and the other could stand watch. Ms. Jessica, glad you could come here to see it for yourself. Kevin handed me a pair of binoculars. Not quite sure if I was ready to see what we were in for, I lifted the binoculars and easily found the group of dead making their way in our direction. Is there any way that they'll pass us by? I couldn't estimate how many were in the group, but it was several hundred by the looks of it. Not really, ma'am. This part of the highway is pretty straightforward and with woods on both sides it keeps the main pack to the road. Dutch shook his head in frustration. Could we set fires in batches so that they'll keep walking toward them instead of stopping in the woods? I wasn't sure if it would hurt the roads, but it was a chance that might have to be made. We couldn't handle that many dead all at once. Might be a plan, Kevin stroked his beard thoughtfully. Do you want to kill some while we're at it? That would be nice, but I'm afraid that the noise of gunfire would just draw them toward us, and we want to make sure they keep walking. Arrows might work. Not sure that we have enough that could actually kill them, though. Dutch sounded doubtful about the logistics involved. We can set the fires. Wait until they're close enough and take out the first wave that makes it past the fires. Then we'll jump in the truck and race to the next fire. It will keep us ahead of them and help to thin them out a little in case they come back in this direction. My head had nodded in approval of my plan. It wasn't perfect, but nothing was going to be at this point. How long is the wall that we do have up? I'd come out to the last outpost in this direction. Not far yet. Two miles, I believe. He pointed to where I could see what I thought was the end of the wall. You all have done amazing in the past few weeks. Another six months and we won't have to worry so much about this kind of thing, but for now, we'll try to come up with a plan to keep them from coming through our defenses. I handed the binoculars back to Dutch and climbed down. 
Thank you for working so hard on all of this. It means a lot to those of us behind the wall. Dutch just nodded in acknowledgement as my head disappeared through the floor. There were two other groups that were working on building walls to keep out the dead on the other side of the farms. We had lucked out with a natural cliff in the third area, so unless these things started climbing, we were safe. We were going to have to move some of our extra people over in this area to help us be able to keep the woods clear of any stragglers that might decide we were their next meal. I'd just made it to the truck when my radio crackled. Earth to Jessica. This is Jessica over. A smile crept onto my face as I pictured the tall hunk that was speaking to me. We've got a problem. How close are you to paradise? Each lookout had a code name just in case someone was listening to our radio calls. There was a group that hadn't been thrilled when we'd rescued people from being their work slaves. I certainly hoped that this wasn't related to a problem with them. About ten minutes away, I can meet you there shortly. Great, see you in a few, over and out. While I didn't really have to go the speed limit, there was also no reason to go so fast that I had a wreck if a zombie or animal crossed the road either. Letting my mind wander away from zombies and the world possibly ending for just a minute, I thought about Link. He'd shown up in my world only a few weeks before the zombies had taken over. I'd needed a farmhand to help out since my ex-husband had left with some bimbo. While the kids and I had done most of the work during the winter months, spring was planting time. Because my ex had hurt me, I hadn't really paid attention to the fact that he was really hot. Okay, I confessed to myself I'd noticed he was hot. I didn't think he'd even want someone's thrown-off leftovers. Then Trish and her kids had arrived, bringing the end of the world with them. Link had mentioned that he'd been in the military, but along with all the other things going on in my world, I hadn't really paid attention. That is until the zombies came and we needed his expertise to stay alive. I still wasn't sure if I'd moved too fast when we'd stolen a few moments for a kiss. Now, I felt like he was my rock during this crazy thing with the undead or the semi-dead. I really hoped that it was the real thing, and not something that had happened only because we might be dead in days or weeks. The pull-off for the Paradise Lookout was just ahead through the trees. I wasn't sure that I could handle more problems, but the apocalypse kept giving them to me. With a fortifying deep breath, I turned the truck off and pasted a smile on my face as I opened the truck door. Oh good, you're here. Dana breathed in relief, motioning me forward toward the Outlook station. Paradise was situated on the top of the hill overlooking the cliff and the front edge of where we'd have zombies coming toward us from the other direction. If you were on the backside of the lookout, it appeared to be the perfect site to put up your feet and enjoy the view. Unfortunately, most of us didn't have that kind of time or the luxury these days. What's up? I hurried up the staircase to the house that had been built on the cliff. We'd made a few improvements, but other than running water and using the solar panels for energy, this had been ready for us to move people in immediately. Dutch showed you the horde coming from the north, right? Link ran a frustrated hand through his hair. Yes, it's going to hit in the next two to three days if they keep up the same pace. Why? I stood next to him, but was careful not to get too close. We'd tried to keep a few boundaries in place so that people didn't accuse of us being distracted. Here. He thrust the binoculars into my hands and I turned my attention toward the south corner where a group of zits, zombie-infected things were gathering. Does this kind of seem deliberate? Someone is trying to come at us from every side. Link shook his head, unhappy with the thought. Is it the group that we rescued all those people from? I scanned the surrounding area for other signs of life, but the only thing moving was the group of zombies that could be seen through the trees gathering in the small little valley at the foot of the mountain. Can't be sure, of course, but it's looking that way. Link lowered his voice, so that I was the only one that would be able to hear. We're screwed. They can't. These guys show they had a much bigger network than we'd thought. They seem to be able to spring from the woodwork, and if we get attacked on multiple fronts, there's no way we won't lose people. We're spread too thin. Link took the binoculars from me and took another worried scan of the area. If it had been a few weeks or a month later, we would be prepared. As it stands, all the newcomers aren't ready to fight for us, and I don't want to ask them to. We could have a horrible situation like the Jacksons did and lose one of our own to a traitor. His frown grew. 
It's not something I'm willing to chance. I understood where he was coming from. Our newest friends had lost someone while they were attempting to rescue the captive group from the makeshift town. Someone had come up during the night and cut off her head, leaving her behind to attack those in her own camp. It wasn't something I would wish on my worst enemy, much less on such nice people as the Jacksons. They'd been through a lot the last few weeks, but then again, so had we. Link's own mother had gotten sick and suffered a bite from her boyfriend. He'd had to put her out of her misery. Not a fun future if these guys attacked us. So what are our choices? I noticed the group of people that lived here were huddled together, murmuring. Be prepared to lose some people. His words sent a chill down my spine as I realized he was speaking from experience. Craptastic, I muttered. He was right. We were going to lose people, and we'd been lucky up to this point that there hadn't been more losses than right at the beginning. War comes with an acceptable loss rate. The only problem is that these are people we care about and losing any of them isn't something that I'm willing to have happen. A scream rent the air and we turned to look at where Dana was pointing down in the valley. What looked like small little tanks were assembling along the road that would lead to our newly fenced area. Tanks? How can we defend against that? The question hung in the air as if it was also afraid of the answer.